Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Crisis Response During a Pandemic. My name is BC Echohawk. I'm a communications coordinator with the Native Connections TTA Center. On behalf of the Native Connections team and contracting officer representatives Maureen Madison and Jan Dunbar Cooper, thank you all for joining us today. In a few moments, we'll start our presentation, but first a reminder that today's webinar is being recorded, so mics will be muted. You can enter your grantee name and cohort in the chat box, in addition to any questions or comments you might have during the webinar. Now to open us up in a good way is our grantee technical assistant colleague, John Bird. John? Thank you, BC, and good morning, everyone. Okay, Nixukwaks, Nistuana Kopono Kapoka, Nitam Skopi Pikani, Sixi Kate Satapi. Mom, just want to greet all of you, my my relatives and in uh in 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 my Blackfoot language and uh to welcome you all here to this uh to this webinar on crisis response during a pandemic. So I'm gonna just do the opening. Um, I, I told you also that my, my Blackfoot name is Elk Child, um, and that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a member of the Umskapi Pikani, enrolled, uh, also known as the Blackfeet Tribe of Montana. It's one of the four Blackfoot tribes of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksikates Tapi. So I just want to go ahead and open, open up this morning. I'm going to I'm going to light up my my sweet grass. The Blackfoot people prefer to smudge with sweet grass or sweet pine. Um, so, you know, just a, a greeting in the in the four directions <clears throat> to get us started off this morning in a good way. And for all of you that are in my computer there. Hey. <laughs> For all of you, wherever you are, you know, I want to extend these blessings, this blessing of the, of the sweet grass to you and your families, your children, your grandchildren, your aunties and uncles, all your, all your relatives, your brothers and sisters. Myself, I have a big, huge family in Montana on the Blackfeet Reservation that I haven't seen for almost a year and a half um, since I've been, been able to go home. So I really think about them a lot and um, pray for them, ask for good things for them. So <clears throat> I just want to do a short prayer. I was about to be old. I o kimat tu kinan a spumu kinan. I kimat tu katak mat topics na na need sit the pigs na be quacks six out be quacks spy quacks or taquia topics that all the all the people of the world the different colors of people of the world the black people the white people the red people the yellow people. Even threw in there the brown people, since that's kind of a thing nowadays. But I was really thinking this morning a lot about I'm really um, I'm really a believer in Crazy Horse and Crazy Horse's vision. You know, Crazy Horse had a vision as a young man, and in that vision, he saw the things that were going to happen to to the native people of this land. He saw that they were going to be conquered and subjugated and that there was going to be a, a long period of hard times following, but that after those times come to an end that there would be a time when we all come together, all four, four races and four colors of humanity and that we would all be standing together, united under the tree of life, kind of like the medicine wheel. And I'm really, you know, I, I, that's a really quick nutshell just of my understanding, but I just wanna say that I really, I'm really thankful for that vision because it gives me hope. And I know that 
I spent a lot of my life studying historical trauma and how we as people can heal from historical trauma and move forward. And, um, and so I'm really, I'm really thankful to hear the vision of Crazy Horse. It's a vision of hope that the times, the hard times that we have endured for a long, long time are coming to an end. That those, those times are, I, I think that we're, we're much closer to the realization of Crazy Horse's vision than we, than we realize and we think and that this current period of turmoil that we're in, not only here in this country, but around the world. I pray that that turmoil will lead us to a good place where we, where we see each other with, with, with respect and where we value and, and appreciate each other for all the good things that we all bring to the table. So I just wanted to open up with that prayer and ask that, you know, all the, all the, all the holy ones hear our prayers. Us Blackfoot people, we, we, we are uh, sun worshipers, not Ducey, the sun. You know, that's who we, that's who we pray to. It's a representation of, you know, of, of the, the nurturing and life-giving energy that comes from, comes from Istabat Debil, the source of life. And so, you know, I just really, I just really appreciate this morning that, um, you know, that we've been given those teachings and that we, we keep our faith, that things will get better, that we, we have a hand in that. Each of us have a hand in that in helping, helping things to get better, helping to move towards that vision of unity and solidarity as human beings. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all for the work that you do in your communities. I know that it's a really hard time. It's a hard time at Blackfeet. I've lost three of my first cousins to COVID. I've lost several of my, I lost a nephew not too long ago to suicide after his aunt and uncle died from COVID. So I just want to, I just want to acknowledge, you know, the hard times that are going on, especially on the reservations. I think, you know, and I pray that those hard times come to an end, that they're coming to an end, and that all the work that we do, all the work that all of you have been doing over the over the years and over the ages, and for those of you that are being that are new to this work, that you're standing on the shoulders of all of those who went before us in, in this struggle, you know, not just in this struggle for wellness and for prevention and sobriety and all of that thing, but just in a struggle to live in a good way and to live the way that we were given on, on this earth. So with that, I wanna end. Thank you all. I'm looking forward to hearing hearing the uh, the webinar, and so I'm going to turn it back over to BC. Oh, thank you. Thank you, John, for those nice words and opening us up in a good way. We appreciate it. So, with that, I'm going to introduce uh, our team members today. First of all, I am Kathy Wilson. I am the program director, program manager with Opila. And we have Marty Richardson, who is a grantee technical assistant. We also have Verna, who is a grantee technical assistant, and we're all part of Tribal Tech as well as being part of Opila. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Verna. Language. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. BC and John for starting us off in such a good way today, Miigwech. Very thoughtful opening and again in such a good way as always and prayers, continued prayers to you and your family and all you joining us today. So today, as you know, we will be traveling through 
crisis prevention, intervention, and postvention response efforts taking place across Native Connections during the pandemic. So first, let's take a look at how crises may present and valuable ways to respond. As shared by NAMI, as you see on your screen, uh, as shared by NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, this quote gives you a start to identifying crisis. Those working in the field, however, will add to this with the understanding that each crisis that occurs is unique and determined, identified by the individual experiencing the crisis. Marty, will you please share SAMHSA's essential values to crisis response for us? Thank you, Verna. I'll be talking about 10 essential values to crisis response. And these 10 essential values come from practice guidelines, core examples, core elements for responding to mental health crisis. And if anyone would like the link to that article, we can provide that link. Number one is avoiding harm, establishing both physical and psychological safety. And so basically we don't wanna do anything else that's gonna harm the individual we are talking with that we want to help. And we'll find that all of these responses have to deal with the individual. It's focusing on the individual as a person. Number two, intervening in person-centered ways, understanding each person's circumstance. <clears throat> so again, each circumstance is different. Each individual that comes to us for, our, for help is an individual when each one has a certain circumstance that they are dealing with. And so we have to deal with them on an individual level. Number three, shared responsibility. This honors the individual's role in crisis and as a partner in crisis solution. And so each person that comes to us for help is an individual, but also they have a responsibility and to, to help us, to let us know what they're going through and they can share in the responsibility of making them better. Addressing trauma, incorporating the individual's trauma again, Many times a uh, mental health crisis, behavioral health issue comes from trauma. And so understanding when an individual has gone through and what is, what is the background, what, what has happened to allow them to be in such a stance to and, and needing help from us. Number five, establishing feelings of personal safety, realizing what makes an individual, individual feel safe or unsafe. Again, an individual response, what, will harm a person? What is harming a person? What makes them feel like they need help or that, that they're not safe? On to the next one. Number six, based on strengths, identifies the resources for individual self-help. Again, um, looking at the individual, what, is, what are the strengths that someone carries with them? Are they, are they very smart? Are they intelligent? Are they educated? Um, do they have other things in their life that can help them to get out of this situation and, and all, out of the circumstance? Number seven, the whole person. Mental illness may not be the only need an individual has. A lot of times there are things that, that people are going through that is not necessarily in mental, a mental health crisis that may bring on a mental health crisis. So talking with that individual, an individual and realizing what, what they're going through as an individual. The person as a credible source. Be not dismissive of out, what we may consider outlandish assertions. And so once again, looking at the individual, talking with that person, realizing that they are going through a crisis. And sometimes what we may consider um, an outland, outlandish statement or something they're going through, just take them as a whole individual. Re number nine, recovery, resilience, and natural supports. Crisis response incorporates an individual's values and daily life events. Again, looking at what an individual goes through on, an, on a daily basis, they may have brought about the crisis. Prevention, number 10, prevention response, a response that addresses unmet needs and promotes improvement. Again, we are trying to help this individual um, be better, be a better person, and to maybe not have, have to have our services anymore or to, to be a better person, to, to move on and, and to live a healthy life. So at this time, I'll pass it over to Kathy. Opila Marty. We welcome you all to our webinar featuring crisis 
response during a pandemic. And we are pleased to have the following grantees share programmatic aspects in this area, displaying what Marty just summarized as essential values to crisis response. We have Travis DeCorey from Undai Young in St. Paul, Minnesota. We have, and he's with the, he'll be sharing on crisis prevention activities. We have Judy Simpson from White Earth Nation who will share on crisis intervention. And Lisa Schrader and Caitlin Martin from Oglala Sioux Lakota Housing will discuss crisis prevention, post prevention during this time of the pandemic. So first, let us welcome Travis DeCorey at Undai Young located in St. Paul, Minnesota. Welcome, Travis. Please tell us about yourself and your program's recent prevention efforts via social media events. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Travis DeCorey from the Undai Young Center. I'm uh, Sichangu from the Rosebud Reservation. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about uh, what the Andai Young Center is. Um, the Andai Young Center was founded by parents and community members involved with Red Schoolhouse. Uh, a lot of students were struggling with uh, homelessness and just fulfilling their basic needs, which moved over into the classroom when they were struggling with their academics. Um, so the Andai Young Center opened its doors in 1983 to provide uh, emergency shelter for youth five to 17 years old. Um, since then, we've expanded a lot. We uh, started the Oyate Nawashi program, which has family advocates, uh, equal case court monitor, uh, the Nakomas project and mental health case managers. Uh, we have uh, the Beverly Benjamin Youth Lodge, which is a transitional living program uh, for youth 16 to 21 years old. And recently we just opened our new building, which is called Mino Oshki Anda Young. And this is a permanent supportive housing unit uh, with 42 units for 18 to 25 year olds. Um, I oversee what we call the mini Johnny Sug program, which is our children. And we started the mini Johnny Sug program back in 1996. Uh, I was actually 16 years old back then and I started uh, working with them uh, back then. Uh, what we do now is we focus on suicide, tobacco and chemical dependency prevention. Uh, we run four to six groups a week. Uh, we have three different staff. And some of the things we do, we do one-on-one uh, -on -one wellness checks, uh, social hours with the youth. Um, and when the pandemic hit, it really made things tough for us because uh, everything that we did was in person. We would transport all the youth from around the Twin Cities, from Minneapolis and St. Paul, even into the suburbs. Uh, that we would bring them here, feed them, uh, run them through our programming, whatever we were doing that week, and then take them home. It was definitely difficult to switch over from doing everything in person to doing everything online. A lot, every kid has Facebook, um, our so different social medias. Uh, we were using Facebook before all this started just to communicate when what was going on during the week, um, but we lost that in-person connection there. So we started utilizing Facebook Live and Zoom. Uh, we started, first we started using Zoom and we realized we could go from Zoom to Facebook Live as well at the same time. But then we also found out a lot of youth could not access Facebook and weren't familiar with Zoom. Uh, since then, we've been utilizing Google Classrooms to do our weekly groups. So that's kind of how we did our weekly groups. And it was really difficult to get kids because they're doing so much screen time with school right now already. So to go from six to eight hours of screen time and then have them want to do more screen time was very difficult. So we had a lot of challenges there, but uh, now we have a lot of youth participating each week. Another thing that we did before the pandemic is we would host what we call youth summits. And the idea behind this was in the Twin Cities, we work with so many different tribal backgrounds. Um, we have kids from everywhere in our program. So what we try to do is bring in people and reach out to communities where they have connections to, but they might not be able to get that connection without a medium person to do that for them. Um, so we started doing these two to three day events out in different communities 
uh, that were close to us. Uh, we started doing them in Lower Sioux, here in Minnesota, uh, White Earth, um, Mille Lacs, Prairie Island. And then we even went down to Rosebud. We went out to uh, up in Montana and did some things up there. We do a, we, we partnered with the Ho-Chunks with their culture camp. And so this is something we do three or four times a year. And now with the pandemic, we're like, okay, what do we do now? And we sat down, we talked about everything and we decided to do an online event. So once we decided to do an online event, we thought, okay, what platform are we gonna use? Um, and the idea came up to create a Facebook event page. So that was the platform that we decided to use. And we put out a couple of flyers to save the day, a poster. Uh, and we started looking at what could we do for this event. And honestly, because we didn't have to pay for lodging, we didn't have to pay for transportation, we didn't have to pay for food, we had extra dollars that we could get even more presenters than we normally have. Usually we have probably one to two keynote speakers and four different activities uh, throughout the course of three days. Uh, we were able to get over 20 presenters um, for this event um, and also do a drawing and have some uh, special performances by local artists here. And once, so once we got the event up and posted, we really hoped um, we were gonna get maybe two to 300 kids. But once, and once we looked, we were doing it on Facebook, we decided why not open it up to everybody everywhere. So that was the idea. So we started promoting it and calling some of our contacts that we worked with before to promote the event. And at that point, I was like, oh, I think, you know, we might get a thousand kids. We ended up getting over 40,000 participants, which was kind of mind blowing at first. And we got a lot of uh, feedback from different communities and teachers that were using the, the event throughout the week for their classroom. So we started each morning with uh, language groups, a, a, a prayer, but I don't want to talk too much about what we did. I want to tell you uh, some of the things that we learned. Um, but it's important to remember, too, that we already had programming that was happening. And we were able to kind of jump on that train that was already left the station. So we had funding for all this stuff already and a background of doing these things. So we weren't just brand new. We were just adding on to something that we already did, which was really great for us. Um, so we started the online event and the first morning we ran into our first issue. So not everybody knows how to use Facebook live. And we had a lot of presenters that were going to go Facebook live. And the first, uh, the first one was actually my uncle up in Michigan, um, from the Potawatomi people up there. And, uh, he did not know how to, we were on the phone with him for 20 minutes trying to get him on Facebook live. And then we finally did. He was. He really didn't know what he was doing. He was up there. He's like tapping the screen. He's like, Chop, can you hear me? Can you hear? And I couldn't respond to him. So it was actually kind of funny because he had his nose all up on the screen. Um, and we actually had to deal with that a couple of times. Uh, from the other side, it didn't look like we had a lot of trouble, but we were, you know, like ducks on a pond over here. Um, so we learned that we have to do walkthroughs with people who don't know how to use Facebook Live and different things like that. Uh, we learned we want to pre record as many people as we can uh, so we can edit their videos and get them uploaded and put them on at the same time. It's really helpful if you have a mixture of people going live and pre-recorded. So if somebody has an issue going live, you can throw that pre-recorded uh, video into that slot and move them around. So we have time to figure that out. So technology was definitely a problem. Um, I suggest if you do anything, any kind of event, to do as many dry runs with people if they are going to go live like we're doing now just so they know they're familiar with what you're doing um we are going to do another event coming up in april we are not going to do a facebook event page we are going to create a facebook page by itself because the event page people had a lot of trouble um, uploading videos finding content the content was kind of moving around um so we're not we're going to stay away from that this time around um, we're also going to, we had a youth talent contest, kind of every youth that submitted a video got entered into a draw. 
but youth had a lot of trouble uploading their videos. So with this next event, we're going to use hashtags for them to put their videos on Facebook. And we're going to use uh, likes and things like that to decide, like to judge our contest that we're going to do. Um, something positive that we did learn from this is when COVID restrictions lift and we go back to doing these things in person, that we can still share this with so many other people. So when we do our events in person, we can still stream it live over Facebook for kids who might not have opportunities and to do things like this. So with that, I want to uh, show you our uh, little bit of our summit. It's a video that we created just to kind of share with everybody what we did and some of the youth that submitted videos. So. Hey guys, I got my rose hips and now I am here at an undisclosed location on the east side of St. Paul and I'm in an empty lot which happens to have this incredibly gorgeous um, flat cedar uh, tree. And so um, again, um, before you harvest anything, you want to make sure you put down your tobacco. feel like using drugs, when you feel like drinking, you know, you have to think about those things. Take your tobacco, you know, put it out someplace. Learning to pray is important. You know, I, I take my tobacco and I put it by a matig, by a tree. You know, a tree has, has, has life, it's powerful. And we pray to those matigs, those trees, but we're not really praying to the tree. Um, we're praying to the Manitous, to the spirits. Bonjour, and Dinoe Maganiduk. Hello, my relatives. We're on day four of Ojibwe Moda. Let's speak Ojibwe. Uh, you know, so most definitely you, you empower yourself as an Indian person. It doesn't matter what tribe, what nationality, what indigenous community you come from. When you know your language or you're learning your language, it empowers you to be a better person. You have more pride in yourself. You know who you are because obviously we're different. There's enough that we've gone through to where, look at the way I'm dressed today. You know, it's cold in here, so I'm wearing a jacket, but maybe I should be wearing a buffalo robe. Maybe, you know, I shouldn't be wearing this hat or I'm speaking to you in English. It gives you a connection back to who you are originally when you're speaking your language and when you're participating in your culture. <laughs> I just wrote this song a couple days ago while I was at work and I named it Words to My Mother. Um, it's pretty vulnerable, but it's a song that I feel like I needed to share to like calm the waters, the, you know, 
calm myself down, you know, it's just things that I needed to say and my outlet is writing. It's basically my feelings to her, I'm letting it go. You know, those feelings no longer serve me and I'm ready to heal so I can start a new lineage of love. Um, and just, I just wanna break the generational cycle that my family is in. And so um, I'm working on myself. I'm targeting these feelings. I'm feeling them so I can figure out how to heal from them and eventually grow. Wishing you were here, it's been 15 years Felt my first heartbreak, I'm doing this for my sake There are words I wanna say, so I spilled them on a page Why did you walk away, was I not good enough to stay? Felt that there was a hole that prevented me from growth These feelings are getting old, I just want you to know I was weaker then, but I am stronger now I have no more more questions, I buried them underground I'm doing all this healing To break from all these curses I will prosper, I am certain I know I have a feeling Once I look in my child's eyes A new cycle will arise I promise I'll be everything and more the longest time an image i had in mind had to accept what was right right in front of my eyes i had learned to let go that i can't change a soul but i still love you oh felt that there was a hole that prevented me from growth these feelings are getting old i just want you to know i was weaker then but i am stronger now i have no more questions i buried them underground i'm doing all this healing to break from all these curses i will prosper i am certain I have a feeling once I look in my child's eyes a new cycle will arise I promise I'll be everything and more the future generations you're who I'm doing this for Okay, and that was just a little recap of what we did. So thank you. Thank you so much, Travis. That was beautiful. Um, the video was great. The work that you all are doing is phenomenal. And so we want to continue that and go on to our next presenter, which is of the White, White Earth Nation. We have Judy Simpson here to tell us about the wonderful things that you all are doing in crisis response during the pandemic. Take it away, Judy. Thank you. Bonjour, everyone. I feel like I have to like regroup after listening to that. I had to step away for a minute because I don't know. I saw some comments coming up too. The just the I feel like the emotion that came with that. I'm like, oh my gosh, you got to get it together. You have to talk here soon. <laughs> um, that was that was really beautiful. What what a great capture that you got um, of many of our youth and. Uh, the trials that they go through, but yet the wonderful supports that are available. So, miigwech, Travis, for what you guys are doing there. Uh, good morning. Uh, Bonjour. My name is Judy Simpson. Uh, I'll use my, I'll use everybody with my, my introduction in Ojibwe. 
Uh, Judy Simpson in Dijinikaz, Swedish in Dudem, Pelican Rapids, Minnesota in Dumjaba, Mental Health Crisis Coordinator in Dinoki. So I either made some people laugh really hard or someone was really impressed. <laughs> um, thanks uh, for having me come on today to talk about our crisis intervention. Um, we have a really fabulous crisis program at White Earth. Our mobile mental health crisis program is under our regular mental health division. And with our mobile mental health crisis program, we provide many of the prevention and intervention um, activities on the reservation. So uh, within the context of that itself, I guess we have prevention, which I don't want to go too much into because you just did a fabulous job, Travis, of preventing or of preventing of sharing prevention with us. Um, so prevention, you know, really we use a lot of activities in White Earth um, outreach efforts to have youth groups, um, culture groups, different types of groups. We have our crisis services that I talked about. Um, we have trainings that we also conduct within our program for gatekeeper trainings through Living Work, Safe Talk and Assist, and now START. Um, as well as we have a, I won't talk, I'll talk in a minute about the intervention. We have post pension efforts too. Um, we have a really great plan that's in place and policies within our school systems on how to respond to sudden deaths uh, and provide that type of intervention and post pension efforts within the school system and within the community as well. So we do have those community action plans in place as well that help us to connect with the community um, after a sudden loss and provide um, whether it's traditional supports and practices or um, westernized medicines and, um, and therapy. So um, as you can see on the screen, here's one of our wonderful prevention activities that we have, but like I said, leads to intervention, you know, cultures intervention. We have a lot of, uh, during the summertime, trying to find different avenues and ways of which we could engage the youth into activities in a virtual way, which many of you, I'm sure, can understand the struggle of that. And our reservation is very large. It covers three different counties. It becomes very challenging to try to incorporate all the youth and get the word out there. So we were using social media outlets as well, mainly using our White Earth Nation Facebook page uh, where we were putting flyers such as the one that you see in front of you uh, about contests that we were doing. Uh, we did do this multi-youth art contest and it was, you know, where were your, where will your moccasins take you? And so you were able to submit a variety of different art pieces and works. And I wish I would have been able to think about it ahead of time to submit it with the slides to show you what the winner uh, had, had uh, presented. And it was a little video with music. It was like amazing. I was like, wow, this kid's really talented. <laughs> uh, it was pretty cool, but it was fun to see the artworks on, on what they feel they want their either life to look like, their community to look like, and help to you know create that vision of what does that look like for them. Uh, and so it was fun to see those art pieces. We also did a, a few different family engagement activities as well. They were challenges. So you were supposed to take a picture of your family, uh, maybe spending some time outdoors together, you know, summertime, were you at the lake, maybe you're swimming in the pool, maybe you're in your sprinkler in your yard, maybe you made your own slip and slide, just something that showed your family spending that time together. Um, we also did other family challenges of submitting photos of families um, to have playing a game together. So whether it's a board game, card game, your own made up game, yard game, something. And each family then was entered in to um, receive a, an incentive and potentially a, a prize for submitting their photo. We were able to close collaborate with one of our local pizza galleries and uh, they actually provided pizzas uh, to every family that participated. So that was kind of cool. So I think I can probably go to the next slide. Perfect. Uh, one of the other activities that we had and were able to conduct obviously during COVID is UCL the Mass. Uh, we had a speaker come through in November. His name was Diami Thomas. He does speak uh, nationally on suicide prevention. 
and self-esteem and confidence among um, Native youth. And he felt the need, especially during the month of November, during um, National Native American Heritage Month, to try and travel the US in 30 days. So he and his friends, his little group here, well, a couple of them are from our place, but a few of his friends piled in their van and um, they ended up stopping at as many reservations as possible and sharing their message. Um, I know Diami was very much uh, concerned about the level and the high rates of suicide on his own reservation ever since COVID. And so once um, that concern came about, they uh, started, he said, start making fried red tacos and whatever they could to make as much money as possible and start their tour. So it was, it was pretty cool. Um, so feel free to Google him, look him up. He's easily defined on the web. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna find Diami and he's got a great connection with kids. So next slide, please. Um, I guess next what I'd like to talk about more so is our, our crisis intervention services and how that looks. Uh, we have, like I said, a mobile mental health crisis program. And our mobile mental health crisis program is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we do have a couple partner agencies that we work with uh, to make this collaboration work. And how it looks is anybody can call into the hotline. We don't define what a crisis is for someone. Um, as they call in, they're called to the hotline number and it's answered uh, by an individual at, at kind of our dispatch hub site. Um, and we are at that point, sorry, I saw a little notice of somebody asking questions or talk about it and distracted me. Scroll moment. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, they're answering the phone, they take down some information and then they route the call to one of our teams. And our team then responds pre-COVID. We were actually responding face to face. We would come to wherever you were. If you were um, at your home, we would come there. If you were at a friend's home, we would go to your friend's home. If you were in the parking lot of Walmart, we would go to the parking lot and meet you in your car. We've um, you know, been to jails and we go into the schools. Uh, we also have a contract with one of our emergency room departments on the White Earth Reservation or, and nearby where we're able to um, provide that crisis intervention services for individuals who come into the emergency room and present uh, with having a possible mental health related symptom versus um, you know, some physical symptoms. So we have a, a lot of great places and, and people that we're able to connect with. Um, now that COVID has transpired and we're stuck in this social distancing phase, uh, we do a lot of our calls with uh, individuals calling into the hotline virtually, just kind of like we are now, you know, having that time to sit and connect and talk with each other. Um, if that's not an option, we can talk on the phone. And so during that time frame, we do our kind of internal crisis assessment. We're identifying you know, what's going on? What's kind of the presenting issue? Uh, what's the concern? And then identify if there's any potential risk factors. You know, is there is there a possibility that the individual um, might be having thoughts of suicide? I just realized I did not plug my computer in. And it's fading. Okay, there, we're good. Um, we also then, if there is um, some risk factors involved, if the individual does identify as having thoughts of suicide, then it's taking that step further. Is there a plan in place? Um, have you thought more details about the actual suicide itself? And with that, trying to help the individual want to remain safe, whether that looks hopefully like keeping the individual in the community in a safe place with family, friends, uh, reducing access to the lethal means within the home or setting that the individual resides in um, or possibility of needing transitioning to a higher level of care. Uh, during COVID, uh, we've kind of had to be a little creative with some of our interventions that we provide. Uh, I feel that it's when you're face to face, you can kind of practice stuff together. You can you know, role play or show examples. So we've had to get really creative with using uh, some social media apps, a um, bunch of just different technology avenues to connect with individuals 
uh, with our interventions. I'm like amazed at how many apps there are out there that you can just download on your phone that are, you know, meditation apps, relaxation. Um, so it's it's been great to be able to explore those other options that we probably never would have tapped into before had we not been sitting in this situation uh, with social distancing regulations. So we do have uh, a link, and I think they're probably posted in the document box or somewhere there on this side. <laughs> but I know the, the worksheet should be listed as well. There's a video link and it's an amazing source. So it, I hope that you copy. If you take anything away from what I'm mumbling about today, please <laughs> copy this video link. It is wonderful. It has meditation. It has yoga. It has exercises that you can do. It also has uh, coloring pages that you can go to to either, you know, use whatever art links on the computer to color in. You can print things off. It has so many different things. You would spend hours on there. So it's a great resource. We use. I've been using that a lot. Our, our staff has been using that frequently um, to give to individuals in need as well to help with some of that treatment modalities. Uh, worksheets. You know, now taking a picture on our cell phone, uh, the worksheet, texting it to the individual. We email worksheets, and they're they're listed too in the file, as Verna said. Um, you know, a couple of them that I'll just mention are some mindfulness. Um, you know, kind of doing some of those body scans through mindfulness, uh, learning to, um, you know, focus and be in the moment and in the present time, doing muscle progression relaxation techniques. Um, also with um, other applications of in the moment, I think is actually the title of one of the, the uh, worksheets that we have. It's, you know, talks about how to, how to slow your breathing down, maybe how to focus on your surroundings and what's happening maybe looking at one specific object and focusing in on the object. What does it look like? Um, you know, is there any sensation from it? Um, just anything that kind of recenters yourself. And so these tools have been very helpful in our crisis response because many times when many of us are just having a bad day, it's, it's kind of just taking that moment to slow down, um, retrain our thought and to be able to just have a moment to breathe. Um, and these avenues, uh, you know, COVID's been, been tough, but it's also been a benefit because now we've had these great, great different options with online and uh, apps. Okay, the other thing I was going to show you as well, we also use traditional medicines, of course, and we try to implement as much as we can within our interventions. So previously, we would carry um, sage and a shell with us as we would go to people's homes or their setting for the crisis response. Um, now it's, you know, hey, I'm, I'm smudging. Um, would you like to smudge, you know, before, maybe after? Um, if traditional medicines are identified as something that the individual um, would like to use in their treatment and healing modalities, then we will drop off one of these lovely little bags that have been sewn together, not by me. Um, and inside is just a tiny little, tiny little shell um, with the little bags that have sage and some tobacco and your cedar and sweet grass. And so those are, are dropped off either in the mailbox or left on the door for the individual. Um, and connecting um, our, our youth and with our callers to traditional healers as well. Um, that's been, you know, a little trickier uh, with not being able to do some of the ceremonies that they've typically been able to do in the past, um, but still connecting with a traditional healer, if that's something too that would aid in that um, healing process and kind of in that stabilization from crisis. So what I have been asked to do is to kind of give you a little breathing activity. This is one that we would that we would do over the phone or video like this with someone calling in. Um, so I will amuse you all. You can amuse me by participating. So mindfulness, meditation, breathing, it's huge. 
So huge. So I just want to give my spiel before we start in case anyone's like, oh my gosh, this doesn't work. <laughs> um, it does. It works so well. Um, my best claim that I can say is years ago, you know, we found out exercise, physical activity so many days a week uh, was so beneficial for our physical health and our mental health. And now it becomes that recommendation when you go to your doctor for your yearly exam, they're either like, hey, way to go on keeping physical or hey, pick it up, right? So now I, I guarantee you, and if not, then you can say, Judy, where did this happen? You were wrong. Um, but I, I guarantee you this is going to become another recommendation. Please meditate 15 minutes a day or several days a week, uh, you know, at a minimum of 15 minutes or so. It's just so beneficial for our health. So I will give that little spiel before I get rolling. So what I want you to do is just, just get comfortable. You know, you don't have to sit cross-legged on the floor in the corner on a pillow or anything like that to meditate. This can be done anywhere. If you're sitting in your car right now listening to this, stop and pull over, don't drive, but um, just sit still. Your chair, move to the floor if you have room and you want to. Just kind of get yourself situated. And now with your eyes open, I just kind of want you to start um, being aware of your surroundings. Do you hear anything? Do you see anything? Maybe there's motion in the hallway. Maybe you hear lots of sounds. Maybe some of you are lucky to hear birds chirping outside a window. Maybe you feel sunshine through a window on your face. And now I just want you to take a deep breath in and just take that breath in your nose and release out your mouth. Continue, just take another breath in and then exhale, let it out. And just notice how your body feels when you inhale and you exhale. Does your body feel slow? Does your body feel anxious? Are your breath shallow? Just take a minute to notice as you breathe how that feels. Now what I want you to do is to just gently close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, I want you to think just for a minute that right now, appreciate the fact that you don't have anything to do for the next few minutes, at least. It's quiet, you have nowhere to go. You don't have to see anybody. It's nothing to do for the next few minutes. Just notice how that feels. Appreciate stopping for a minute. Now I want you to notice maybe how your body feels. How does the weight in your chair that you're sitting feel? Does it feel different? Do you notice how you're sitting in your chair? Maybe where weight is shifted to one side more so than the other. Maybe if you've chosen to lay down on the floor, do you notice how your body feels as the earth and the ground holds you up? Now, without opening your eyes, notice the surroundings. What are you hearing now? What are you feeling? Deep breaths in and out as you continue to think about what's in your surroundings. Get comfortable in your place. Notice again your body. Is it feeling restless? Are you feeling still? Maybe you're feeling heavy or light. Just bring your attention to your body. Just become aware of how it feels. Now let's bring the attention to your breathing. Maybe put your hand on your stomach. Notice how it feels to breathe in and then let the air out. Keep breathing in and out. Take a couple breaths to notice how that feels, how your body rises and how it releases. Now let's count to 10. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a breath in. And as you take a breath in and feel the rise within your stomach, your chest, 
that's one. And as you exhale, that's two. Inhale, three. Exhale, four. Continue just on your own till you get to 10. And keep breathing. Now notice again how you feel. Your mind starting to wonder, are you feeling restless? If your mind starts to think about something else that's normal, it will, just gently bring it back. Maybe by focusing on that breath again, counting with a breath in as one, exhale as two. Maybe you just remind yourself to breathe in Breathe out and continue to focus on that breath. And again, just take the body scan. How do you feel? Do you feel good? Do you feel calm? Do you feel at peace? Maybe you feel really restless. Take a couple more breaths in and out. Now, Gently start noticing things around you again. The sounds, you hear them again. The noise maybe in the hallway. Maybe you have kids in the background, loud coworkers. Start noticing the sounds again. I want you to gently open up your eyes and keep taking just a couple more breaths in and out. And now I want you to really pay attention to how you feel, what it, how you feel different from when you first started the breathing exercise to now. And what I would ask all of you to do before you move forward in your day is to feel and think about how it is that you feel. If you feel calm right now, if you feel at peace, maybe you feel really relaxed, maybe you feel tired, but take whatever it is that you feel and bring it into your daily life. Think about if you approached everyone with feeling calm as you do maybe right now. What if you approached life with being relaxed, patient? Every time I get off my mat, I always tell myself, you leave behind the things that do not serve you and get up and start your day. So with meditation and with breathing, if you continue to do that, which I would encourage all of you to do, please remember to take a moment at the end, notice it, how it is that you feel and transition forward in your day, taking what you learned in your practice with you throughout your day in your life. Miigwech for having me speak, thanks. Judy, I have to wake up here. <laughs> my glitch. My goodness. That was awesome. <laughs> so, thank you, Judy. That's so refreshing. I feel like we need a, a quick debrief in the chat. So if anyone and everyone wants to share out all that response, you, you know, your body's response or your mind's response. And I certainly hope and pray, Judy, that your envisions for our future to include meditation in a daily routine are also on the way to becoming. So thank you for that. Hope those come to fruition. So fruition, I'm a, I am got to wake up. Okay. <laughs> Miigwech, Judy. Okay. So as hard as we do work to prevent and intervene, some situations do escalate as we know. So let's take a look at Oglala Sioux Lakota Housing's postvention efforts taking place following attempt or a sudden death, switching gears here. So Lisa, as we know, we're all in these uncertain abnormal times and abnormal circumstances call for those abnormal responses, which your program so steadily is making efforts and striving to do daily. So um, we know where you're ever evolving during this time of social distancing to provide those post engine needs. Could you please share a bit about yourself, your program, 
the post pension aspects happening and how your program is making these possible, especially during this time of the pandemic. Okay. Wow, those are some tough presentations to follow. Oh my gosh, those were amazing. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Lisa Schrader and I am the director of the Ovala Sioux Lakota Housing Native Connections. And um, the, the focus of the um, OSLH Native Connections was to really look at the, the trauma that is going on in, in our communities and how it's affecting are you from the ages 10 to 24? So, so we, it's important to know that we have um, 1,100 11, housing units. Um, and I believe there is 14 um, housing areas. So um, we, we work closely with our, our housing, they call them occupancy specialists on issues that are going on in the housing. And the, the most, um, of course, is the traumatic um, events of, of grief and loss. So um, that's what we'll talk a little bit about today. Caitlin, did you, I'm sorry, Caitlin, would you like to introduce yourself? Again, I'm half asleep too. That was just so awesome. Thank you again. <laughs> Uh, my name is Caitlin Martin. I am an outreach worker slash intern with Lisa here at OSLH Native Connections. Okay. We have the next slide. Okay. So with everything that we are doing now with, with all the, um, everything that's put in place for the pandemic, um, there's COVID task force. And so if we come up with an idea um, even to go and um, make visits to families that have losses. Um, one requested a candlelight, so we had to plan it out, you know, like how social dis distancing would take place, how masks would be where, um, where we would get enough hand sanitizer and, and so forth. And so every time something comes up and, and if people ask Native Connections to be involved, um, I have to go in front of the task force that meets weekly. And um, we've been turned down a few times. Um, for example, we thought, okay, it's kind of calmed down. Um, so we went in front of the task force and I asked if we could do like a social distancing walk to bring awareness to, you know, like the importance of reaching out for um, help and, and where those resources are. And um, they denied me, they denied us and said that, you know, that the infection rate was 12% and, and to come back in two to three weeks, hopefully it'll be down to 5% and then we could be out there in the communities doing that type of work. Um, we've been really, really um, fortunate to have the, the assistance of the, um, the, the tribal tech. Um, we have been doing our tribal action planning and that has been like really pulling together. I believe it pulled together the, not only like the, the providers, but then also the grassroots people who are doing work, those people that are doing a lot of the prevention work that are 5013Cs that are tribal members. And so we started a, um, a coalition, it's called a Hochoka coalition. And Hochoka in our language means the center, right, Dave? And so um, that, that kind of um, slow down for a little bit, but we're pulling everybody together again to see how we can share trainings and do more work through people who are actually in the community. And that includes a lot of the postvention efforts like healing ceremonies, wiping of tears and so forth for the people who are dealing with loss. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so starting, starting with like some of the work that we've done, um, we, there's a few of us that are trained and um, the curriculum by White Bison called Mending Broken Hearts. And so um, we're working with the um, alcohol program to begin doing that virtually. But what we've done is some of the families that have experienced loss in grief, especially with some of the recent suicides, we've um, taken the curriculum right to them 
and said, look it over, you know, and contact us. And so I have three mothers of recent suicides who connect with me like maybe three times a week. And, and so we go over the Mending Broken Hearts curriculum. We also have, again, we shared before, we have our life maps that we do with the youth. And so what we do, what we do is um, we, we have an LGBT youth group. And so um, like Caitlin, you know, drove to every one of their houses, masked up and, and dumped them off with um, snacks and, and resources. And so that's, you know, some of the work, because a lot of these, when, when a trauma happens in the community, when a loss happens in the community, especially suicide, I mean, it affects everybody, you all know that. And so we, we reach out to as many youth as we can. Um, where one of the things that um, I thought has been really effective is um, we, we have a, a local lady who, who's made us medicine pouches and we've provided these medicine pouches to pallbearers. Now the pallbearers are usually the best friends or the closest relatives to, to the people, the young people that we've lost. And so we had a young lady create the medicine pouches and then we have a um, local mentor that will come to, cause like now how they're having the services, they're having a teepee by the homes and it's like two or three hours and then taking them for burial. So we, we will um, join and have him talk to the pallbearers and, and give them medicine pouches and talk to them about the meaning of that. And um, I remember one of his, one of his talks included, you know, telling the, the young boys, you know, um, you know, that not only are you, you know, feeling this loss and, you know, getting up and, and not being able to call one of your best friends, but maybe you can walk over to his house, knock on the door and ask mom, do you need your trash taken out? You know, um, you know, share a memory, a happy memory with them. This is one of the things that we like to do. And I, you know, is there anything I can do um, to help you around here? And, and just try to make that connection and, and be, a, and kind of like be a part of, of her family and, and share that, that whole grief path together. And so we have that mentor that has been doing that. His name is Vic Camp and he himself lost a son five years ago to suicide. So his story is real. Um, it really catches the, it really catches the family's attention. And I think it's been real successful as far as helping them to see, because he really stresses the importance of not turning to um, alcohol and drugs for your grief, your, the journey of your grieving. So that's, that's been, I believe has been real successful. And I, I say, I, I, I want to say, you know, the Native Connections, we've gotten a lot of good feedback from families and they're staying connected with us. So that's good. Next slide. So these two young ladies, very, very young, beautiful ladies are Tiny Decor and Eileen Janice, and they are like the icon for suicide prevention here. They also play a big role in postvention. They are ones who um, voluntarily, just because they're known for the work that they do, um, will go and, and go to a house of a mother in the housing units. Um, we'll take a grandma to the ER if they need to. We'll pick up a, a youth that has attempted and came back from the psychiatric unit and, and take them to their follow-up appointment. If not, they'll take them to a um, spiritual leader or, or someone that's holding an inipi and they'll, they'll be with them. They're real vital to the community for healing. I have them come in and talk about community healing as much as we can to providers and to community people. Um, they're, they're part of the community response and um, that we're, we're trying not to say crisis response, we're, because it's a lot of post venture work, we're saying community resiliency groups. And so they have done tremendous work in this area. They, are, um, they have been here um, for probably the last 20 years they have been doing this work. So 
they are like a, a real strong partner of Native Connections. And they probably know the name of every single youth that has come through um, the emergency room. And so um, we, we honor them because they honor our communities with their, with their work that they do. Amazing, amazing individuals. And um, they continuously share their trainings. They're trained in ASSIST, um, QPR, and what is the other one? There's one more, Caitlin, I'm, I may be forgetting, but, but they're, they're huge as far as work in the community. Anytime there's any type of um, work that we're doing at the community level, we, we have to we contact them because they know exactly what works best, what fits best for that community. Next slide. In talking about postvention work and talking about instilling, helping instill and empower, empower and instill in resiliency, it's really important that we, we use our cultural teachings. And um, one of the examples we are using today was um, the Wounded Knee Massacre. And the Wounded Knee Massacre, um, we had Lekshi, Rick, two dogs, and Tui, Ethleen, Iron Cloud, two dogs, share the account of the Wounded Knee Massacre from their lineage. So it was through the eyes and the story of a chief American horse. And so what we did is we had them talk about the real story versus what is written in the books. And um, after that, there was a lot of, like we did um, visualization and imagery and um, talking about resiliency, talking about healing, how important that is for us to move on as a people because historical trauma is here and it's in our DNA, but it's really important to know that that, that, that resiliency is always there. So we don't be, we, we learn to heal, we learn to forgive, we need to, we, we acknowledge and, and, I've, and we've had that said a lot of times, like youth will say, oh my gosh, no wonder my mom, my grandma did this. You know, they, they start making that connection. So we, we really talk a lot about that. We've done like the battle of the, um, the battle of, um, oh gosh, in Montana, <laughs> sorry. We talked about, um, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a cat in here. Okay, so we talked about how it went from the battle of Wounded Knee change to the massacre. And then we talked about how alcohol played a huge role in that massacre. And so the story that was told by Lexi Rick was, was real vital. We had a lot of, we had a lot of, not. We had a few youth, but we had a lot of teachers that were on that call. And so we talked about getting that true story out and how whenever we do the teachings in history, how that needs to be implemented. So I believe the healing part is, is there. It's a journey. And when and one of the strongest things that I heard um, Tui Ethleen say is, is like, we need to know where we're going, but, but to do that, we have to look back at where we came from. So I apologize about the fumbling at the end, but um, I have a cat in my room. <laughs> so um, I'm going to end there because um, I wanted to end with that quote by, by um, Tui Ethleen. Um, Caitlin, if you have anything that you feel I'm missing on the post-venture work, you're welcome to, to help in this conversation. Thank you. Uh, no, you are at all. Okay, so that is it. Thank you. Wonderful, McGwitch, Chief McGwitch, Lisa and Caitlin, we appreciate you sharing all of that. Very helpful information. 
on post pension and thank our other presenters, Travis and Judy as well, for sharing such important work happening and reflecting the efforts across, you know, taking place in crisis response towards wellness. I'm hearing so much of that language shifting during this pandemic and it is so uplifting. So thank you for that. And we thank all of our Native Connections grantees as y'all continue to be the Ogitichi dogs warriors helping to carry our communities through the pandemic so much. We appreciate you. Your work is impacting all of our people across Indian country and Alaska. You're all warriors and healers and so very worthy. So thank you. Kathy and Marty, I know we're full on time, but I hope we have some good input from our participants here. Questions? Yes. These are wonderful ways crisis response continues during the pandemic. And we really appreciate all of you sharing. So now there's going to be questions and comments and you can raise your hand or put your comments in the chat and we will monitor them and we will get them answered. So are there any questions or comments? And you may feel free to unmute your mic. Everyone's a little quiet and perhaps. Say, Verna. Dave? Yeah, I have a, um, just want to circle back to what uh, Lisa mentioned earlier about, instead of calling it a crisis response, what did she say they call it in their community? Help me out, Lisa. I heard community response. Was there more to it? It was community community resiliency groups. Community resiliency groups. Thank you. I love it. It's a strong statement. Any other comments, feedback? I know, I hope you all, each of you presenters had an opportunity to scroll through the chats. You had very good uh, feedback. And of course, uh, some folks would like some links and video, Travis, your video. So we'll, we'll try to share that out. If you can share any of the uh, links here in the chat, that would be great to your Facebook event. And coming up, I know, you know, Travis mentioned in April, they're planning another big event. So we'll look for that information to follow. I think uh, BC may have some words on that for us at the end, but going once, I don't want to keep everybody too much longer past the hour that we've gone over. We certainly appreciate you sticking with us for all this excellent information we could not be more appreciative of. Okay. Nobody's interrupting us, Dave. So I think it's up to you to send us off in an excellent, good way. Thank you, Brenna. And I want to acknowledge all our presenters. I really appreciate your, your good, your sacred words, your knowledge and uh, experiences uh, that you've been able to share with us. Um, at this time, I want to acknowledge our sacred breath. Um, the breath that we, we, uh, we take in from the time we wake up in the morning until we fall asleep. And uh, you know, we did a, a breathing exercise that was very powerful today. And uh, there is a uh, gentleman that I really admire, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Maybe some of you know him. He's uh, an American uh, astrophysicist. He made a statement that really stuck with me. And he said, and I call, you know, I'm going to call it sacred breath. Um, the, the atoms in the air that we breathe today are the same atoms that our, our ancestors took in to their body, through their mouth and to their lungs and to their blood and, and out their, out their their uh, nose and uh, you know it really stuck with me because uh, you know when we sing we're using our sacred breath when we play the flute or any kind of instrument we are using our sacred breath and when we share our good words we're using our sacred breath so I want to um, 
uh, close with this flute song for uh, each and every one of you for good health, um, wellness, uh, <coughs> safety, and uh, and blessings to you and your community, your families, all your loved ones. <coughs> Thank you, Dave. We appreciate you uh, closing us out that way. Um, please keep in mind we have uh, upcoming webinars, uh, including uh, Strategic Action Planning Success Stories Part 2 and Culturally Adapting Evidence Based Practices. So, um, I did want to let you know, we also were able to join Travis for a podcast. We'll be releasing that this Thursday. He goes into a little bit more detail about um, what he did to get things going with their event. And um, I really uh, look forward to their April event. It sounds like it's going to be a big success. And we appreciate our other presenters for joining us, Lisa and uh, uh, Judy. So. Uh, thank you, folks, for being with us. We look forward to seeing you the next time. Take care.